episode 24 of the Orchestra Podcast. Uh, we have two of my good friends here, uh, Dr. James Ray and Mr. Stephen Picard. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Stephen Picard was my, my best friend and music buddy at Rogers High School uh, last year, and, and we had great fun working together. I think this time last year, we, we may have been in, oh, well, this, uh, about a month ago last year, we would have been in D.C. together, and that was a, a, a treat. It was certainly interesting, at the very least. It was definitely exciting. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, uh, I, I bring on these two guests together uh, because Stephen right now is working on his master's at uh, Central Washington University, and Dr. James Ray is a professor at Western Washington University, and I thought we could talk about what it looks like to be in college from the teacher's perspective and from the student's perspective. Um, so first, let's do some introductions. Stephen, would you tell us just a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, first off, thanks for having me on. This is really fun. Um, my name is Stephen Picard. I had spent the last seven years teaching at the high school level primarily, one year of choir and then band at Cascade High School and the last six at Rogers High School. Mostly band, I had two years of teaching orchestra in there, which was a real gift. And then uh, last year was looking for a change or an update, an upgrade of some kind to where I was at and uh, an opportunity to be a teaching assistantship for Chris Bruyer in the jazz department at Central Washington University came up. And I interviewed for that and applied to be a conducting major studying with Lewis Norfleet and Paul Bain and we fast-tracked that for a year of study. So currently, right now, um, I am at home due to the <laughs> pandemic, but um, I am working primarily on my thesis and hoping to be done and defend in June. So doing a two-year program in a year, it's definitely been crunch-worthy, but uh, I wouldn't trade the time and the experiences that I've had. It's been a real blessing. Great. James? I'm sure uh, uh, many of the required listeners know who you are already, uh, but people who are, are just watching this for fun, would you introduce yourself? Sure, yeah. Uh, I am uh, James Ray. I'm teaching at Western Washington University, uh, but I'm a Central alum, so there's, there's a tie in there. Uh, <laughs> And actually, I just got to Western this past fall uh, after teaching for a dozen years in the public schools, uh, the bulk of which nine of those years was actually in, in Port Angeles uh, School District, um, all different levels, elementary school, middle school, high school, um, all teaching strings, all string orchestras. So, I mean, depending on your perspective, I've either been blessed or cursed with only having taught. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so, so this has been an, an interesting year in that it's my first year kind of teaching in, in higher education. And, and by the way, here, have, have been a pandemic to go with it. So it, it's certainly been an experience. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I'm having, a, in a similar way, um, some, some remorse for the seniors that I have right now. Thank you very much. Because not only for them you am too. I their third teacher, uh, but now all of the end of the year stuff that was maybe, I mean, not going to make up for it, but, but still give them the send off that they deserve regardless of who's at the helm. Now that's been, you know, ripped out from under them as well. And we're going to try any number of things to kind of um, emulate those end of the year experiences, but there, we just, there's no way that we can replace uh, given the circumstances. Uh, but anyhow, let's get to the, the issue at hand here. So, Stephen, what's it like to be in college courses uh, and not be able to be face-to-face -face with your professors? Oh, well, this quarter would have been different as it was because my the bulk of my credit load would have been my thesis, um, but my other in-person things would have been both performing and conducting ensembles as well as leading ensembles, mm -hmm. um, being a jazz TA and then a a large group conducting degree focus. Um, I was working with both jazz and the concert band realm. And so I, I had a pretty packed afternoon at least with um, my playing and leading responsibilities. Um, and then of course my lessons with Lewis and other study that yeah. I do on the side with Paul were always very in depth and lots of head scratching. <laughs> but um, I definitely do miss that that one-on-one, -on -one, especially with my, my lessons. Lewis was always very good about 
being able to really dig deep and find ways to get you to think about things in a different manner. And, and Paul was always so good about kind of creating the caring side of it and um, taking a really thoughtful approach to score study. And if you were stuck in the rut somewhere, he'd always have an answer. Mm -hmm. um, so not having them as resources as I do this and trying to just do phone calls and Zoom meetings definitely is a big it's a big emotional struggle. Um, you know, there, there are times that it is easier than others. Mm -hmm. um, the other aspect that's been difficult is all the setup of online integration for um, the jazz program. And then the other class that I work closely with is the 100 level history of jazz course. Um, I do a lot of grading in that class and answering of questions. And um, so for, for a couple of professors, it's been very easy to translate over to a, a, a world that is all technologically established. Um, mm -hmm. And then others have had to have more help. And so I've, I've definitely been um, in the role of, of helping assist with online setup. And I've had to learn a lot myself too. I've, I've gotten real, real cozy with Microsoft Office Suite. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I think that if, at the very least, when, when we go back to teaching in the fall, whatever it looks like, I think I will have some different tools than I anticipated having in my tool belt. That's, that's me speaking positively, of course. Well, and, and as someone who is still in the public school setting, I have seen both great success and great frustration from yes. uh, amongst I mean, colleagues here in Port Angeles and, and all, all over. The, the, the good news is that people are connecting uh, over groups like Facebook to try and help each other out and provide some alternatives. But there are people who were already doing these things. Like I was already doing my playing tests on Google Classroom the whole year. So the kids were familiar with that format and we're just doing more there. Other people who you know are still grading on paper and then transferring it to <laughs> digital. Yes. You know, they've needed some extra help. And I think what we, what we can take away from this is that whatever situation we are in, uh, when we get out of this, that a willingness to adapt to the circumstances is like a, a, a key element in teaching. James, you're, I see you nodding your head. Do you have things to add here? Well, you know, one of the um, glass half full things I've been thinking about and, and talking to other folks about is um, there's been a lot of obvious and, and, and justifiable frustration among uh, those who are in the applied, uh, in the applied sorts of courses, the, the, the private mm -hmm. lessons, the, the ensembles, right? How am I supposed to somehow translate what is by its very nature requiring people to be in the same room creating sounds at the same time and, and, and all the different things with I mean not just balance and all that but there's the interpersonality right that, that, mm -hmm. that comes into what we do and and I guess kind of my uh, again glass half full perspective at least that I'm trying to at least keep in my own head is what this is doing mm -hmm. is it's requiring us as musicians to go back to our fundamental roots as creatives yeah and, 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 and on a certain level, isn't this kind of what we do all the time, right? We take a situation which may not necessarily be ideal, especially those of us involved in the educational world. <laughs> and we figure out how do we find a way to music anyway? How do we find a way to take, you know, a whole bunch of lemons and, and open a lemonade stand, right? And, and still find ways. And, and I think some of the examples we're seeing people come up with are, are of course, uh, the Zoom ensembles where, where, where they're clipping different recordings together. Oh, but which, those are I mean, so hard to make exactly. and put together. Yes. Yeah, really, really hard to do. But, but I don't think that's necessarily uh, the only way to do it. There's lots of different ways where I'm, I'm talking to you. I'm not directing any ensembles right now. Uh, in terms of uh, in, in terms of the, uh, the, the the curricular models, but I'm talking to directors who are using this time to bring in guest artists, right? They're yeah. bringing in you know professional performers from from different realms. Uh, they're having students dive deeper into the repertoire, doing more of the research sorts <laughs> of things that they may not have done in, in, in a terribly focused way if if their job was to simply come in and play or sing. And so and so I'm seeing again musicians do what musicians do. 
uh, which is we find a way to, to just make things happen. We find a way to, to, to get our creative juices flowing and find a way to still create something uh, of meaning and of value. So, so that's one of the things that I'm seeing uh, many, of us, many of us try to do with this situation. Absolutely. I, I think I never would have had the time or the, the impetus to create this uh, format to bring in uh, university professors and professionals uh, to interact with my, my students. I mean, uh, maybe a couple times a year we could bring in somebody from a university to work with one or two ensembles, depending on how much time they have. But being, you know, clear out in Port Angeles, it's not like I can just call up any number of my music buddies and they just come out just for fun. It's, it's quite a distance. So at, at, at some level, this is a better way to get more um, professionals into my classroom uh, because like, uh, for instance, I interviewed a composer from Sweden a couple weeks ago and it was, you know, just instantaneous. We're talking to a composer halfway around the world and the kids are getting exposed to, you know, some, some deep knowledge from people with a lot of experience that we otherwise wouldn't have had time for because we are, you know, rehearsing, getting ready for the next concert, or I've got to make my fourth copy for a cello player or, you know, whatever. Next year's going to look different. One year of grace and then, then we move on. <laughs> uh, yeah. But uh, I, I've, I've heard a lot of hubbub going around from the college student side of, are you still getting what, what, what you're paying for? So Stephen, how do you feel like your educational experience has uh, maybe not you know, improved or diminished? Uh, that isn't, those aren't helpful terms, but how has it changed? And do you feel like you're still meeting the goals that you sought out to meet when you you left your gig in Puyallup uh, to, to pursue more further education for yourself? Um, well, I guess I would start by saying that I've, I've had moments of having a pity party about, you know, why isn't this the way I'd hoped for? Oh my gosh. But then I've thought back to where I was a year ago and when I was investigating this process and I'm still glad that I pursued this route. Mm -hmm. I think about the growth that I've had, not only as an educator and a musician, but as a human through this, um, for, for those that don't know my situation, um, I have a house and a mortgage and a wife and a two year old, almost three year old that stayed in Puyallup. So Monday through Friday, I was living in a house with two other gentlemen who were doing their master's work, uh, both of whom I knew from my undergraduate, which was great to have people I knew from that experience. Um, so I'd come home on the weekends. It's, I, I will say on that fact, it's very nice to be home and to see my family every day and to still be working on my thesis my 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 credit schedule certainly worked out perfectly to not be really taking any coursework where I'd be having to do traditional study of reading and test taking and things that, that this time is solely for me to focus on my ultimate project of what I want to take out of this and um, and apply to when I return to the classroom. So my my thesis is without going too much into it is focused all on score study mm -hmm. and taking a synthesis and evaluation of three major texts uh, that are out there and then kind of, I haven't quite decided what I'm going to do with it yet. I'm waiting to get through the books, which I have about a week left to do before I decide exactly what the initial outcome will be. But mm -hmm. I, I have already really enjoyed being able to really focus on that. Um, I wish I could be applying it with ensembles, but that's just kind of the way things are going right now. And I know well enough, at least that I will get to apply it. And I think that's my big motivation. So that, that was a long-winded answer, but I, I do feel that I am getting a value out of my yeah. experience right now. Well, and, and James, to the extent that you are able, what are people in charge of ensemble classes doing or what, are, what, what is the university's response to the credit requirements for, the, for those ensemble type classes? Yeah, yeah, and, and I can't speak with a whole lot of authority because that's yeah. uh, not my lane at this moment. Uh, but I understand that they're doing some different collaborations among the different types of ensembles, the choral, uh, the instrumental uh, band and orchestra, those 
things. Uh, I, I think they're doing some work with, with Copeland's Tenderland, and uh, I, I think if I say any more, I'm going to completely botch up whatever their project is. <laughs> but, but again, I, I know that they're doing things like, you know, scheduled discussions, like uh, students are, you know, being exposed to different resources and things that, again, they may not have access within the context of, you know, this particular ensemble that I enrolled in. So again, I, I, I know they're getting creative. Well, and the, the first guest I had on, uh, Greg Utes, who was my composition uh, professor and among other courses at PLU, uh, he was talking about, let's take this time to do the deep work so that when we do come back to rehearsal, you look at your stamp partner and say, where have you been? Yeah. Uh, and, and to that extent, I think universities could take advantage of, of that, that dynamic of doing the, the deep work um, because it, it's so easy, especially as a violinist, if you're not, you know, concert master or, you know, principal to just kind of do the bare minimum and coast through rehearsal and not get noticed and, and, and be okay. Uh, but now when you're alone and you're recording yourself practicing, there's no coasting. There's no, uh, you know, acceptable minimum. Uh, it's, it's you and, and the music. That's all there is. And to that extent, I think we can potentially have more growth than we do um, just, you know, going from rehearsal to rehearsal and coasting at the bare minimum. Sure. Well, you know, another thing I'm thinking about, and, um, and I'm not the only one thinking about this, is as an educator, as someone who uh, has a good sense, or at least I think I have a good sense, of where the students in my different classes should be as a result of being enrolled in this course, um, trying very hard to balance that with the recognition and, and trying to be explicit with students about recognizing, listen, this is absolutely extraordinary, the, the, the times that we're going through. Uh, th there's really hardly anyone, if anyone, it, it, with living memory of living through a time anything like uh, what's going on right now. And so trying to figure out ways to balance uh, the need to with respect to this class with the very, very real reality that, you know, I can't have the same kinds of expectations um, that I would if everything was normal. Mm. And so trying very hard to, when possible, lighten the workload. Oh, you know, yeah. You know, just waking up and saying, you know, maybe it's okay if I don't hit every single standard that I normally would have. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in those cases where I, I'm looking at something and I'm saying, I can't really see any way around this particular thing because maybe this is part of a, bar a, a larger sequence that students have to be prepared for to move on to the next stage, finding a way to streamline it and, 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 and make it accessible. And um, one of the things, you know, that I've certainly been doing is I've, I'm, I'm known for bring, being kind of a hard nose on, on deadlines and things like that. Mm. I've had to become absolute Gumby over that one. You know, uh -huh. it's coming in late. Here, turn it in late. Um, hey, uh, the, 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 the online system closed before I had a chance to turn it in. Just email it to me. And just trying to find ways to be very, very flexible. But also, I'm having a number of conversations. It's interesting what the students are telling me. Uh, I've talked to quite a few students who say, you know, I try to check in anytime we're having a one-on-one -on -one meeting and say, hey, how are just how are you doing with, with everything? And quite a few have responded, you know, it's actually okay. You know, some have said, you know, I really like being home. I get to see my family more and, and some of these other things. Others have said, you know, I've, I'll, quite a few others have said, you know, this is hard. This is really difficult. Mm -hmm. um, this circumstance is going on and this other thing is going on. And with those folks, I have no problem saying, listen, I understand that we're in this music theory class and we're studying X and Y and Z, but let's get real. I'm far more interested in you preserving your emotional, mental, social stability and health than I am about you learning the, the finer points of fully diminished seventh chords. I mean, come on, let's just be honest here. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the day, preserving yourself and your sanity and those things is far more important than anything in any of our curricula. So mm -hmm. for me, that has been a point that um, I'm trying to be very clear with myself about and very clear with my students about and then trying to demonstrate as much as I can through how I'm actually, you know, helping students navigate this quarter. Well, and, and I'm sure both of you, uh, similar to me, we are kind of um, a, a little bit, we have some, some, some armor from the doldrums of, of this quarantine because we still have a routine in either our coursework or creating content for classes. And, and that, that element of routine keeps us protected from 
from feeling stagnant. Uh, but but Stephen, uh, even though you are at home and you're with your family now, uh, I wonder if uh, you might talk to us about how students might deal with this not being able to interact with their peers, uh, not being on the same routine that they're on. How might they um, still stay focused on progress here, uh, especially if they're in, uh, you know, you and I both work with a number of students who even during the school year weren't going home to the best environments. And, and you've got an okay environment of home, but I, I, I'm sure uh, to some degree the being, you know, full-time dad, full-time husband, uh, a little bit takes away from the focus on, on your schoolwork. So how might our students uh, focus themselves uh, and stay positive during this time? Yeah, that's that's one I'm working on big time. Um, it, it is lovely to be home, but um, we have a very active toddler who wants to play with you all the time and you say, no, I, I've got to read this book by Frank Battisti. Um, <laughs> and then start synthesizing this paper. Um, it's, it's tough. I was, um, I ha I do have a morning routine that I'm able to get up and, and do a little physical activity. And then I go for a, a one to two mile walk, depending on how late I get up. <laughs> <laughs> um, on, on my walks, I usually, I either listen to podcasts or I'm listening to the news. Uh, typically, NPR and they were talking about something just just like that the other day they were discussing a, a specific community in Ohio that has a very high methamphetamine addiction rate and um, that while the level of reports of abuse or lack of care have gone down it's because there are not the traditional people who are able to normally make those reports being able to report them because so many students are just at home and it's not being noticed. So my, um, you know, in our, in our own world about central, I, I felt like in this day and age that pretty much any college student that would be able to attend a university would be able to have some kind of technology access personally. And I realized how naive that was now because they were the cent central Washington tech department came out emailing everybody asking that if they had used laptops or tablets or anything else that they could share for mm -hmm. a larger number of students that didn't have access to things that they would be grateful for that and um, I was very humbled and surprised to read that and it, it just made me realize how many students are still struggling with being able to connect in certain communities mm -hmm. I mean you, you know that in Puyallup the last several years we've made a large push to get one-to-one -one devices for everybody and I think some of us thought oh geez this is a huge push why are we doing this all so fast and I think it definitely speaks that we got lucky with okay lucky is a hard term to use but we are <laughs> we are in we are in a good spot having to handle this pandemic and knowing that students from third grade on all have one-to-one -one devices and they've even been able to get I think first and second grade students' devices. Um, well, uh, and yeah. maybe uh, I don't mean to interrupt, but the no, it's fine. Uh, right off the top of my head, uh, and James, I I'm hoping you can speak to this when I'm when I'm done gabbing. Uh, but uh, no matter how many devices we send home to kids, uh, no matter how many resources we set up for kids, no matter how much money a school district spends to ensure that every student has every tool. The one thing we can't control is their learning environment. At school, we can make it the same or as um, equitable as possible. But when the kids go home, we have no power to make that uh, equitable for all students. So how do we pers uh, continue uh, this course of study, keeping in mind that each learner is in a completely inequitable environment. God, if I had the answer to that, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I think it's, to me, part of the pragmatic piece of that is, you know, kind of, kind of like you're saying, we 
can't necessarily control it. Mm -hmm. Recognizing that as much as we can do as educators, there are certain elements that we simply cannot, cannot affect. And so to me right now, that goes back to, um, that goes back to if I can't, if I can't control it, then I need to recognize it. And I need to draw upon my empathy in that recognizing that even in the design of the assignments, right? Mm -hmm. If I'm doing an assignment that presumes access to multiple screens, that presumes access to reliable high speed internet, that presumes this, that, and the other thing, then I've got to be really thoughtful about that. Mm -hmm. Which isn't to say, well, I can't do it because, it, but but it does say that I've got to make some kind of allowances or um, I, I, I've got to have a, a, a degree of flexibility that recognizes that not every single person in the classroom is going to have the easiest access to that. And kind of to your point earlier, let's say that, you know, the students do have a laptop at home. How do we know that they're not sharing it with, you know, three or four or five other people? Exactly. Uh, how do we know that they're not in a small apartment as part of a building where you simply can't make any sound after a certain point to disturb the neighbors and or you're sharing it with who knows how many. You know. So, I mean, there's there so many factors that I think um, I, I don't think we necessarily take that and say, well, I'm just not going to do anything, because I think to your point earlier in terms of the structure and routine, one of the reasons that I've gone ahead and made lesson plans, had assignments and things like that, sometimes I think just having a routine. Just saying, you know, we're still going to meet on these days a week. Uh, that in itself can be a source of security mm -hmm. uh, for our students, right? Um, but still, we've got to understand that uh, for some students just aren't going to be able to do it to the same level as others. And others might be able to kind of barely cross the finish line, but that's after so many efforts to kind of jump through hoops, you know, driving and parking outside of that one shop that has Wi-Fi because it's the only way I'm going to get this thing turned in. You know what I mean? Yep. And so, I, I, again, I think we've got to uh, make explicit access of our own levels of empathy for those things. And, um, and, and then also encourage students to be vocal, right? One of the things that I found with students, especially high school, and I'm seeing it college students too, is they don't want to be perceived as weak. Mm. They don't want to be perceived as making excuses. They don't want to be seen as people who are just, you know, coming up with anything and everything to get out of work. These are, I mean, th these are some diligent human beings we're dealing with. And so as a result of that generally good quality, they're not necessarily going to tell me when they have access issues. They're yep. not going to necessarily tell me when elements of their home life are making it extraordinarily difficult to do what it is I've asked them to do by this Friday at 11.59 p.m. Right. And so I've had to make an explicit point of saying if there are issues, I put it in writing, I say it in person. If there are uh, uh, obstacles preventing you from doing X, Y and Z, I will be as flexible as I can possibly be. Please let me know. Mm -hmm. Please, please let me know. And, and the ones who have, you know, I've, I've tried to stay true to my word. I will work with them however they need. You know, yep. uh, my student, uh, my students, many of my students are first year students. Some of them are near the end of their um, uh, their, their, their degrees. Uh, but among that group, I have students who are traditional college students, you know, 18, 19 years old. I have people who are, you know, married with families. <laughs> and each of those places um, is going to present a, di a different number of circumstances, especially right now, right? Mm -hmm. Because if your student has kids themselves who they're who are also out of school <laughs> and, and, and they're trying to educate them and, 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 and so many, you know what I mean? You, you just have to be flexible about those sorts of things and you have to make sure they know that you get it or at least that you're open to getting it and, and, and are willing to work with them, right? Yeah, and uh, I, I just saw one of those tacky things on Facebook that it's just, you know, where it's the, you know, words with a picture behind it and you scroll past it. But it, it said, whatever your coping strategy is right now is how you are gonna, or the way that you s cope with this situation is whatever you're doing right now. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, us having this meeting, me organizing these, a Zoom meeting so that I can make this podcast. That's how I'm coping with this and staying sane. Uh, if binging Netflix is the only thing holding you together right now, that's your coping strategy. And uh, as educators, having absolutely no judgment about what that is, so long as it's not you know doing something harmful uh, to themselves or others, I think we need to be realistic that that our students and our colleagues are doing what they need to do to 
to just survive. Um, yeah, you know, and I, I would turn that back on ourselves as well. Yeah. And and that's been a lesson I've been learning through this, is as much as I'm trying to be thoughtful and accommodating and empathetic, sometimes I have to tell myself, hey, listen, you don't necessarily have to have to right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I've had some moments where I felt like, you know what, I just, there's just certain things I just, I can't do it. Yep. And I've had to literally make myself put down the iPad, stop planning the lesson, go and just, you know, hug my kids, go and just sit on the couch and do absolutely nothing. And, uh -huh. and remind myself the same way I'd remind my students, that's valid, go for it. You know, so, so I think as educators, we're so much about, uh, our, our hearts are so much with the people that we serve and work with, we forget we've, we've got to allow ourselves grace as well. So Stephen, as we, we talk about grace in assignments and coursework, how have you experienced that kind of leniency with your, um, your mentors during this time? Um, well, one, one course, so I, I was still registered for a couple of the large ensembles that um, I would have been conducting and playing in. And um, one, well, Lewis and Paul gave me some grace in the fact that uh, they both knew that I needed to be focusing on my thesis and that a lot of the work that they had prescribed, um, you know, it's kind of some, some of what James was talking about with um, some review of literature, some study, when you were talking about that too, that you know, we can come back stronger from this because we get a chance to be more in depth. Um, Lewis said, you know, I, I know you know a lot of this stuff and that you've, you've experienced this both as a student and an educator, so just don't do any of it. You're fine. <laughs> knowing, knowing that I have one quarter to write this paper in, and this is a massive project that really needs to have my focus. Um, one of the professors that I work for, Mark Samples, he is, excuse me, a musicologist, and um, he teaches the history of jazz course, and he's mentioned to me multiple times, if you ever get a point where you're just doing too much, or you feel like you don't have enough time to focus on your work and your family, please let me know. And there are other people that can do this work or I myself can take it on. Um, he's a perfect example of somebody who is great at adjusting the content and how his course is delivered mm -hmm. given the situation. And also how he can be like James, you were talking about being there for your family and taking a break. Um, he is upfront with his students in the syllabus that says, you know, um, I have three points in the day that I check my email. All exams and homework will be due during the week, not on a Sunday at 11.59 p.m. because I'm with my family during that time. And if an emergency came up, then I, and I'm not checking my email, that wouldn't be fair to you. Um, He's also changed his late work policy to be adjusted given technology issues and um, has also helped some students that were, again, James, like you were talking about, that um, needed accommodations. He has stepped right in and, and been very helpful. Um, so I've, it's been nice to see that both in, for myself and in what professors, the ones that I'm working for, what they're doing for their other students so that in my own grading, I can be helpful and lenient as a teaching assistant. Well, and we can circle back through this and, and maybe uh, James, then Stephen, uh, but what something that I'm considering when I'm making coursework is uh, what are there, the other teachers asking of my students? Because I would love to have a weekly, you know, playing test. Like I, I, I got before they had made it free, I got access to smart music for, for all the string students in the district and uh, free access to sight reading factory for all of the music students in the district. Uh, but as we got to like the third week of quarantine, I started to consider if they're having to do, you know, three or four English assignments and three or four history assignments, and whatever else they got going on in their life, including the situation at home, even in the best of situations, if every week they're gonna have to get this playing test done and uh, you know, not all musicians are created equal. For some people, it's gonna be a breeze. For some people, they're really gonna have to practice and you know, do like 10 takes before they record. And so I scaled back and just switched to 
once a week, it's a written response. And uh, I, from time to time, will do a, just show me like a, like less than 10 seconds video of you applying a skill on your instrument, but not like a playing test or anything like that. So how, how has your experience, James and then Steven, have been uh, balancing coursework with a consideration for other, other demands on students? Oh, my first. Uh, one of my classes is a uh, uh, secondary instrumental methods class. So uh, basically 10 weeks on how to run a middle school band or orchestra program. Go have fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I talked for the first time in the fall, which was just for me a daunting prospect. How am I supposed to <laughs> package all of that in, 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 in the 30 hours? Um, this spring, I'm teaching it as a semi-independent study for a few students who weren't able to catch it earlier in their curriculum, but they need it because their next stop is uh, student teaching. Um, so we're doing a semi-independent study. We're just meeting a few times over the term, and I'm trying very hard to uh, work with them in terms of other coursework they're taking and integrate it. So one of the courses that many, several, if not all of them are in is a philosophy of education course. Mm -hmm. which happens to be a central component of the way I do my secondary methods class. Uh, it's very important to me that, that our ensemble directors come in with a philosophy that's student-centered, uh, that's about their growth and development and not about me and my repertoire list. I mean, that, yeah, that's a whole other... Anyways, uh, so that's really central to me. However, why should I require them to write a whole other paper on it when some of the same philosophical underpinnings are going to apply to any kind of educational setting? So that's one of the major projects for the course. But I'm saying, listen, if you're already doing something like this for this other course and this other one over here, and actually the, the other faculty from these courses and I have been in communication too, let's just have them do one major project. And, I, and I'm going to say for my part, let's make sure you hit on a, a, some certain aspects that are going to be specific to secondary ensembles. And for me, I'm happy about that. So not necessarily if, if there's a way to integrate with work that they're already doing. So that's one thing. Um, another one of my courses is uh, music theory, which typically would have met three times a week. Uh, what we're doing with that is uh, I've reduced our live meetings to twice a week. And then our, so we're meeting Mondays and Wednesdays, but then on the Fridays, uh, that's when we kind of have assessment do, assessments due and things like that. But it's also done with the understanding that they've got other courses for which, you know, they're, they're enrolled. Some of my students are taking seven or eight different classes right um, wow. within and outside of the music department and one of the things that just has troubled me is how many students have reported to me that they're spending you know five six seven hours a day in front of a screen um so i say okay if there's a way i can i can't eliminate it i don't know how to i, I haven't figured that out yet yeah but if there's a way i can minimize it and, and allow them to do as much work offline as possible uh but the other thing i did is is, is i reason that i still want to do some live stuff and it's 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 kind of about the curriculum, sort of, but not even that, because for that, a, a lot of the lectures are pre-recorded. But it's, for me, um, I'm thinking about this idea of forced isolation that we're all in. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and if not managed well, what is this going to do to our social interactions as human beings, right? And so part of it, it a lot of my lectures are, lectures are just, uh, you know, Q&As and mm -hmm. ways for people to just develop, the, to maintain those social connections. Um, I'm more of a fan of the term of physical uh, distancing rather than social distancing. I think we should be trying more than ever to keep those social bonds as strong as yes. we can. So one of the things I've been doing in all my courses is trying to find ways to have like small group work, mm -hmm. right? So my theory students, okay, here's an excerpt where we're studying whatever this thing is. I'm going to put you in a breakout rooms here in Zoom, three or four people, and the four of you are just going to, you know, I said, listen, you can either work on doing this analysis or you can just BS and talk about me behind my back. I don't care, whatever. <laughs> but just some way for them to just be communicating freely with other people. Um, so just those are just some of the things I've tried to think about designing the course, not just for the sake of the course, but for the sake of considering the other things that they're re required to do beyond what they do with me. And also, again, just trying to maintain some kind of, again, human connection. Well, I, I love to repeat people back to themselves, but it uh, was, over the summer while we were, you know, talking on the phone quite quite a bit, you and I, James, we were talking about like uh, planning repertoire for groups and having realistic expectations about how much a student can achieve, but knowing that you can still achieve, uh, you know, a high level of, of success, you can still achieve your standards, uh, but, but have some realistic expectations 
about what kind of goals you set. You can you can have both. You can have your cake and eat it too, with uh, you know meeting standards as long as your expectations facilitate you still meeting your goals. Uh, I think I've said that all upside down and backwards. If you want to <laughs> clean that up for me. No, I mean, I, I, I think, I mean, it's just a basic idea of, uh, of skillful teaching, which takes time to develop, which is, you know, have high standards, but they're useless if they're not realistic. Mm -hmm. Basically, is kind of what it is. And um, it goes back to knowing your students, right? Not mm -hmm. just knowing them as musicians, but knowing them as human beings, right? What is it that they can achieve? Which usually is a, is a pretty high bar, don't get me wrong. But um, taking into account as much of them and them as a group as you can in terms of selecting repertoire, in terms of selecting playing mm -hmm. test accurate for that, for, for, for that mm -hmm. matter. Um, and then also just having a sense of patience about them meeting them. Mm -hmm. If that first submission isn't great, let them do it again, right? Absolutely. If, if they come in, you know, hey, I worked really hard on this, but I didn't blah, 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 blah. You know, is my response gonna be, well, it sucks to be you, deadline's passed. Or is my response gonna be, okay, well, let, 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 let's see if we can work on this together and, 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 and see how you can get there, right? Um, but yeah, and, but I, but I think also having once, once we're sure that those expectations are realistic, showing the students enough respect that you're going to hold them to that standard, mm -hmm. because by holding you to that standard, what I'm saying is I believe in you enough. I trust your intellect and your skill uh, acquisition ability enough to say, yeah, right. This is the bar you're going to get there. I'm going to help you every possible way I can. Mm -hmm. because I think if we do the opposite, we say, okay, well, fine. Um, I, I, I think that's one of the greatest ways we can show disrespect to students. I don't, mm. think, I don't think you measure up. I don't think you're worth the investment of your time, my time, our, our creative energies together, right? But again, that's predicated on the fact that they're, that they're valid standards to begin with, but mm -hmm. that's a whole other diatribe. <laughs> well, I, Another podcast. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I forget what the original question was that, we were going to include you in as well, Stephen. If if you remember, let me know. <laughs> um, was it regarding um, trying to make adjustments towards submissions? Yes, with this the quarter, consideration for other coursework. Yes, um, or, I or know how was that, that experience for you? Are are some instructors? Um, being really, really demanding and others are more gracious and you're kind of maybe spending more time on, on one task and giving less to another just because of how one instructor is, is being demanding? Well, the, I guess I can give the answer in a few parts based on who I'm involved with right now. Um, Mark Samples, who does the History of Jazz class, laid it all out on the table, a lot like James, you were saying, with um, expectations. Make them realistic and know that we need to give students a chance. And so every, everything is well laid out. It says this is, a, this is a 100 level, five credit class. You should expect this many hours of work. Um, please make sure you're budgeting your time. If you have questions about how to do that, please ask me. Um, and he's actually posted some things on our Canvas page about how to budget time and how to be an effective student. Um, when it comes to the large ensembles for band, it's very similar for um, what they're doing to the, as the orchestra with Nick Coilly that they're doing some literature review and then they had two other units that the students could choose from. Unit two was supposed to be more aligned to professional promotion, uh, mm -hmm. like creating a website, your resume, how to uh, reach out and speak professionally to other people. And then unit three was more about listening as an adjudicator. You know, if you were to sit down and critique a group, what would you do? And so they were actually gonna put up some, uh, some less than perfect recordings, if you will, of groups <laughs> and try to get your, your ears working. Um, unit one, which everybody was supposed to do, is geared towards um, a lot of the major works for wind band. The only one I can think of off the top of my head, I think, was Variations on a Korean Folk Song by James Barnes. And is that right? Yes, I think. Anyway, um, Lewis and Paul just sent an email out this week that said, we're hearing from a lot of students that this is quite a bit of work. Um, we thought that deadlines were spread out enough, but we're going to honor the request that has been made from many of you. Um, we would like you to stay with unit one and finish that 
and, but we're going to cancel unit two and three. We apologize to those of you that have gotten started on those and we'll credit those to you for your score. Um, if some of you would like to continue that work and submit it at the established deadlines, we will grade it, assess it, and give you feedback on how to improve, um, but there won't be a grade associated with it. Um, when it comes to the jazz ensembles, uh, I've, Chris Bruyere has done a really cool uh, different approach to having a big band. Um, for jazz band, we have picked eight tunes that the students have to learn a chunk of. And between him and John Harbaugh and myself, we have given a background on the tunes and several different recordings of them. And then the students have to record themselves and multi-track it through things like GarageBand or Audacity, um, Band Lab, different apps. And we assess them based on their ability to match the style of the recording, whether it's a classic Count Basie tune or it's something more modern. Um, and then for the combo class, we are having them go through the project of transcribing both the melody and the solo of their choice off of the kind of blue album. Mm -hmm. And so their, their learning style and their learning how to improvise based on what the greats have done. Um, but we are accepting late work and we're also encouraging students to reach out if they have questions. And so, you know, the, we've only had two, three weeks of submission so far, but I've definitely gotten a lot of emails and Facebook messenger messages from the students that I'm connected with via social media. Hey, can you listen to this? I'd like some feedback <laughs> or, Hey, um, on your assessment, be really hard. I mean, I really want to nail this one. Right. And, um, well, it, I, yeah. When, when we started this, this modality of learning, it was kind of like, you know, the Greek myth of Sisyphus pushing the rock up the hill <laughs> as he'd get to the top of the hill. And then we, we changed the assignment because it wasn't working or we did something wrong. And so now the rocks at the bottom of the hill, we got to start all over again with a, a different format, a different grading system. And we commit to it a hundred percent. We push the rock up the hill and then, Oh, well, we got to change things or, you know, here in public school, OSPI's changed tack a couple of times. Um, but after sort of the first time the rock fell down the hill for me, I decided maybe Sisyphus could get the rock up and over the hill if he just made small incremental pushes in a general direction. You know, we, we want to get to the top of the hill. Does that mean it's, we accomplished this one assignment in the one way that I thought we were going to do it? Or does that mean my goal is that when this school year is done, to some degree you're a better musician or you have a better understanding of music? If I commit to that and just put out information, videos, small assignments here and there, uh, things that require small and consistent amounts of effort, then I think we can keep the rock from falling back down the hill. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I, think, I think enough students know that we're all just trying to figure this out. Um, mm -hmm. I listened to a webinar a week ago from Scott Lang, the student leadership and motivational speaker and he's been doing free webinars and has he's made his leadership curriculum free mm -hmm. um his whole deal was last week was from surviving to thriving and talking about planning for next year and mm -hmm. um i think you had mentioned adaptability earlier um being adaptable to the situation but then taking the time to know that what, what we have to do doesn't have to be world changing but it does have to matter to the students and so getting them, I think the other part of that is making sure they know that we are passionate about what we're putting out to them. And if they see that what we're trying to compile is valid, I think they're more willing to work on it. Well, if I can quote Michael Scott from The Office, it's the adapt, <laughs> react, apt. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's a good re reference. React, adapt, apt, is that the way he says it? Uh, you know, we, we got to look at our situation. What are we working with? Uh, suit the way that we're going to approach it based on the tools that we have and the circumstances we're in. And, you know, as silly as the phrase is, apt is, you know, do it well. Whatever it is that you set up, you know, follow through on doing it well and having grace with students about things like deadlines or, uh, maybe even the format with which you're willing to accept a certain assignment. Uh, you know, I, I think James, maybe you can speak to this, but 
now is not the time to be, you know, getting after students for strange, uh, you know, MLA citations that are, you know, you didn't put two spaces after that period or something like that. J James, how's that kind of thing working for you? That's actually kind of right out of part of my playbook here with um, the secondary methods class, the 400 level that I was doing in the fall. Um, I believe, and if we were still in person, I would still believe that knowing something about the scholarship of the field is important. Now, these are not masters or doctoral students, but they are scholars. And so knowing how to navigate the, the, the world of whether it's research literature, or professional literature, and knowing how to do professional citations, I think is valuable. Now, here in the spring of 2020, when the students are just trying to get through, <laughs> right? Um, I put away my APA manual, which is kind of the standard for, for music ed. Um, and I'm not even bothering with it just because, again, you have to step back and, and it really makes you figure out not just what's important, because I think those things are important from a from a from an academic point of view. But uh, what what is the core essential? Uh, what, what, one of my colleagues, uh, Patty Bourne, um, talks about just the sense that the, oh, gosh, he frames it so much better than I do. But the essential <laughs> questions. She says, you know, and she, this is just general advice she's giving me in terms of designing college courses. What are the two or three essential questions that need to be addressed through this course? And, 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 and through the current circumstances, I think that's all the more important. What are the two or three things that I want to really make sure students get? Mm -hmm. And what can I allow, not necessarily to fall by the way. So I, I think a lot of... Um, a lot of what's going on, the fact that I'm working in a professional field where students are going to go off, go off and be practitioners, is part of that question for me is, okay, what do I want to make sure they're equipped with now versus the things I know they'll learn one way or the other out in the field? Yeah. Right? And, 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 and so one of my mantras with, I'm teaching up for string pedagogy class as well as this uh, secondary music education methods class is, you know, if you ever find yourself in this circumstance, just call me. <laughs> call me and, 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 and we'll talk about it then. Yeah, there's this whole element of things that, that you might want to be aware of, but honestly, we can have that conversation over the phone when, when, when you're at work and panicking. <laughs> well, so, and, and, yeah. uh, an experience I had, you know, far before this quarantine, and I, I won't name, na name names, but this exact example of citations. So I, I had a philosophy professor that was insanely strict. I mean, nobody got an A on their paper. And this was the, the kind of professor that, for very good reasons, wanted you to do your first draft and then come in and have a person-to-person -person meeting and talk about what needed to change. And, you know, so I did that and went through the first process and there's just red ink all over my citations. And I, I had sat down for like three or four hours with, uh, you know, the, the MLA, whatever edition handbook it was, or I forget which format we're using, which it always frustrates me about citations is that there's a thousand ways to do it. And every professor expects a different one, but treats it as if it's one of, you know, God's commandments. <laughs> and I went back for my third one-on-one -on -one meeting about this one paper with this professor. And finally, she looks at all the red marks and says, I'm being kind of ridiculous about this, aren't I? <laughs> and I wanted to, you know, yell and scream. I was like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, you know, but instead, I, I tried to lead this kind of thoughtful discussion about, well, what do you really want for my citation? You want to know who, who produced this content, uh, you know, their, their name, or you want to know any organizations they're affiliated with. You want to know who publicate, who published this publication or resource or whatever, and maybe when it was published, if it's been revised or updated in some way, and how I accessed it, whether it was print or uh, a journal or just, you know, online off of a website. That's really what you want to know. So how can I give you all of those things in a way that's going to make you happy? And then she kind of made a little diagram of what she wanted, and we re realized that it was not what the handbook said to do, what she expected. <laughs> so I, I think in or outside of quarantine, we need to think about what we really want from students. Yeah. And uh, 
not the citations are incredibly important. I, I'm, I, Stephen, as you're working on your thesis, I'm sure you're crying over there hearing me talk about this. <laughs> uh, but the what we really want from our students is on a citation, as I just explained, you know, who wrote it, where'd you get it, why is it credible, where can I find it if I wanted to look up and make sure that your citation was correct, if I, if I really wanted to. Uh, and the same with uh, a music assignment. If, uh, James, you're trying to get kids to understand German six chords, does it matter that they found the hidden one in this weird, you know, Schumann, uh, you know, art song, uh, but they couldn't find it because it was a, you know, inharmonic spelling that they didn't recognize? Or is it just as simple as can you, can you find any example of a German six in music any, anywhere? You know, what, at, at what point do we make some concessions about the, the specificity of the format? Uh, maybe, uh, Stephen, since you're working on a dissertation, um, how, how are you coping with those really minute things where it's, you feel like you've come back six or seven times and it's still not right. How, how, oh, how does a student well, deal with that? That would, that would imply that I've gotten there yet. I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm still so much in the in the research part of it, but um, kind of my timeline I created for myself. I, I have to start getting there next week and coming up with my bibliography and and then start citing things in the paper. Um, I have a similar professor to what you were speaking of in your philosophy course, but somebody that I had a really good relationship with. He was a um, double reads professor for me and um, also my history of music professor, um, Dan Lapori. And he teaches methods of musical research at Central for the mm -hmm. master's program. And he is all about nailing the citations. And every assignment we did was just I mean, I, I remember having one assignment that took hours uh, over several days to do. I was going, this is ridiculous, but I knew <laughs> that it was going to make a difference later on. And so I'm very glad that I mean, there were only four people in that class this year, but I was the only person that was there every day. <laughs> and I was very grateful for the notes that I took. And as I'm looking through, um, you know, trying to look at this Chicago style um, so I take, which I never worked with prior yeah, to this. I mean, it exactly was, it was APA. Um, yeah. So I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for the, for the time that I took, but I know that, um, I know that at least who will be looking at the, the paper, they're not going to care quite as much, but I am going to ask Dr. Lapore to look over my paper so but I can nail that specificity of getting all the citations down and to make sure that the bibliography is all correct and formatted. Cause he's, I mean, he goes through with a ruler and makes sure that your margins are accurate. And... Well, as, as somebody who is still kind oh, of yeah. frustrated by that, uh, that, that level of, you know, minute specificity, Maybe James, since you are on the other side of this academic divide, why are those kinds of things so important? Like going through with the ruler and the margins, and the <laughs> you put the period before the quote, not after the quote. Why are those things important? So, 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 so do you want the uh, the academic professor dogma, or do you want me to just give you my take? <laughs> I want your take. I know the dogma. <laughs> well, here's. Here's my kind of takeaway, because I have I have had those same levels of befuddlement, bewilderment, especially in uh, our music education, mm -hmm. which the more I'm in this profession, the more I realize we have our feet firmly planted on both sides of that term. There's the music and the musicological side of things, and then there's the educational side of things. And, and we're at this nexus really between those things. The standard in terms of, of scholarly style and all of that on the musicological side tends to be the Chicago style, which mm -hmm. in college we'll often learn is the Turabian and things like that. Whereas on the educational side, uh, which is part of the social sciences, they tend to subscribe. They want APA, yeah. APA. And there are some similarities, fish, but there's a whole lot of differences. And those of us who are in music education, we are blessed or cursed with needing to learn both of them really well 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it, it's almost like being bilingual, really. And and my takeaway is that, and I'm not going to put this as eloquently as I possibly could. I I, I feel the inaccuracy is coming. Uh, but the different citation styles, in a way, represent the different kinds of emphases of the different fields, right? Um, in the humanities, which is more along the side of the Chicago Turabian, there's, I mean, it, it's very historically focused in a lot of, in a lot of ways. Um, and so, I mean, I think one of the reasons you see a lot of footnotes, right, in, in, in Chicago style, is there's something about the, the, the way in which those, those other, conver those different kinds of conversations enrich the narrative that, uh -huh. that you're reading at the time. Whereas in the social sciences, it's not that those things aren't important, but there's a lot of emphasis on, when you get to the scientific part of it, right, there's an emphasis on recency. Right. Yeah. So if, if you're citing studies and developments and education or psychology, these other things, but everything you're citing is like pre-1960. Well, then you've got to ask about the relevance of, of what it is you're talking about, given all the new research that's come in. Right. Mm -hmm. so, 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 so getting that, uh, that temporal provenance, I can't think of another way of saying it right now, uh, versus some perspective sorts of things here. So I think that explains why you see different styles, because I used to be one of those who can the, all these people just kind of get together and come up with one style and then call me when they figure it out, <laughs> right? Well, and it's, <laughs> and it's not just that you have to learn MLA or Chicago or APA. They themselves, you know, update every couple of years, some of them every year with a whole new set of rules. It honestly, to me, it, it maybe I'm a conspiracy theorist, but it seems like a cash grab that they want to <laughs> buy their new book every year. And that's the only... It's like, oh, well, maybe if we change the rule on periods after certain page breaks, yeah. then we can make another, you know, couple million off of people buying our book again. They're uh, all run by Pearson. <laughs> <laughs> He's, right, that's true. Well, exactly. They're all run by Pearson, and we all have to, you know, do our ed TPA and pay them, you know, $300 to pass go. Uh, <laughs> Well, I, I think I think what's interesting, and you, I'm, I'm kind of playing devil's advocate here a little bit, I guess. Please. Um, I was just looking through some of the changes. APA just came out with a brand new one early this year, mm -hmm. and a lot of it is in response <laughs> to the plur the, the prolifer prolifer pillow. Wow. <laughs> the proliferation of of uh, electronic access material. Yes. And things like that. Um, and, and the widespreadness, which now will work, um, of, of different resources. So one of the things I, I'm actually seeing is a kind of a streamlining in, in, in some of the citation requirements for APA. Mm -hmm. uh, I think APA just got rid of requiring that you have the location where books were published, right? Because in today's global interconnected world, does it really matter whether it was published in New York versus London? Mm -hmm. I mean, so what, right? Um, and, and, and so there are a few things where I've seen it, it streamlined a little bit. Um, access dates are, are, I'm seeing less emphasis, emphasis on those, uh, because, mm. you know, one of the things we would know about the internet is nothing is ever really deleted. So, you know, there's always a way to retrieve this specific record, uh, it, 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 just different kinds of things that, that I think are trying to respond to, uh, the, the way in which information is available and distributed, but also responding to social, social change, right? Mm -hmm. There are different norms regarding, in, uh, for instance, gender reference. Yeah. Um, I know one of the things that APA has become increasingly uh, uh, em embracing is, is the idea of the they pronoun, right? Or, and, and even in recent editions, they've really discouraged when you're writing. Now, reference that style manuals are more about than just how to do the bibliography of the works cited page. It's, it, it weaves in throughout the entire, you know, uh, entire writing. And APA and maybe others too has, has long been uh, wary of the idea of using gender pronouns. Mm -hmm. Right. And even first names, anything that might make it easier for those kind of biases to, to influence either the writing or the reading of, of the research. Mm -hmm. um, so so I think for me, what has gotten me a little less eye roll about all these sorts of things is kind of figure out, OK, why, why, why these different things in punctuation? And and, and for, for one style, I abbreviate the first initial of the author for the other style. They want the full name. And so I think is, is that the more I think about um and the more I read about why they're kind of going into these things, I guess it makes a little more sense. And yes, it still drives me nuts. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, as we um, 
exit out of the, the doldrums and mundanity of citations. I've got two more questions so we can wrap up this conversation. Uh, and I'd love uh, both of your answers to this question. Uh, first question, uh, why don't we go Stephen first? Uh, what are you most looking forward to after we're out of quarantine? Well, I, I guess I'll answer in, in relation to my timeline as a student and then returning to the education field. Um, our, our principal at Rogers, as you know, his, his famous line is love kids and teach. And if, if there was ever something I needed more, and I think most of us do, it's to be able to go love our kids and to go teach. Um, I'm definitely motivated and inspired to just be in a classroom again and to do things better and to make music. And, and I think that it will be so healing. I think one positive that can come out of this quarantine, at least for the people that are looking for it, is that so much of what we have for granted won't be taken as such. Um, I know in the history of jazz beginning quiz that we took, um, sorry, Dawson's awake now, um, <laughs> that uh, um, many students when asked, what are you fearful for this quarter, were missing the fact that they weren't going to be in, in a traditional lecture hall. They all wanted to be learning from somebody that could passionately speak to them. And I, I thought in, you know, in such a connected world in, elect, in an electronic manner for students to really want that physical and then emotional social experience, I, I just thought that was beautiful. Um, I think that's what I'm looking forward to. I, I also, I, I think going to the grocery store will be nice. Um, <laughs> maybe going and having a, a beverage, but it's definitely <laughs> going to be, I'm going to be more leery about it, but I, I'm also going to just look forward to being human and to being with people and um, looking back to getting that, that emotional fulfillment of being with people. Although, you know, being able to talk like this, I think we're going to be utilizing zoom more like you were talking about you can't just bring people into the classroom as easily as you would like but i think we're all learning that this is providing a better experience or an easier experience not a better experience james i mean steven you're so profound i mean the first thing that popped into my mind when nathan said what, what are you most looking forward to there is this uh, uh greek food truck <laughs> yes. Downtown. Yes. Okay, I'm with you, James. <laughs> and it's got this I am incredible. There. <laughs> <laughs> the, the whole time you were talking, I'm trying to think of something more uplifting and more profound, but I'm just like, geez. <laughs> I, I really want to go get a hero. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to have for dinner now. Oh. <laughs> no, but uh, I, I think, honestly, if, if, if I'm thinking about it, it's it's. Um, I'm not going to say that we're no longer able to have human connections because because as both of you have, have been talking about, we're finding other ways to do that. Okay. Uh, but one of the things I miss professionally, at least, is is being in my office over at Western and just hearing the hubbub, oh. just, the, just the the things happening are, are around me and, and 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 just you know happen by happenstance, running into students and colleagues and sitting or, and just talking about something really important or something not important at all. Um, just, you know, like, like you said, being around human beings, um, going and just doing things with my family that aren't necessarily around the house. Although I will say one great advantage of this is I'm seeing my family a lot more than I have like, yes. probably ever. <laughs> and, uh, just being able to just hang out with my wife and my daughters and, you know, we're not all hustling and bustling to whatever the next rehearsal or, or class or whatever this thing is. And so that has been kind of a hidden blessing of all of this. And so I guess if I'm look, one of the things I might be looking forward to is a way to not lose that just because we're back to normal. Mm. So. And my, my last question uh, that I ask all my guests is if you can think of a time uh, recently or, or in the, the distant past of when you were struggling with your career in music or struggling with, um, 
just life in general. What could you go back in time and tell yourself to either be better equipped to deal with it or to help you cope and survive? Uh, why don't we start with you, James? Yeah. Um, I've had, uh, the job I had before Port Angeles was, there were some great things about it. There were some really difficult things about it as well. Um, I felt early on, uh, I started to get a sense that what I'm doing professionally at the end of the day, even though I love the music, isn't about the music. At the end of the day, uh, my students are human beings whose lives I am honored to, to try to impact. They are not my minions who I need to just play these notes perfectly so I can go back to the principal and say, look at the award we won. And I started to develop that perspective in my first couple of years, but I was not in an environment that was wholly committed or conducive to that way of thinking. And so that created some real difficulties. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess if I were able to go back and tell myself something, I'd go back and tell myself, don't worry, it's worth it. Right. All the, ex all the difficulties, all the, all the struggle, all the, um, because you're on the right track. Mm -hmm. and and you're going to find yourself in environments where you will see the value of this line of thinking you're starting to develop and you're going to see that you don't have to choose between compassionate teaching and effective music making high levels of music making it's not one or the other right so i go back and i say stay the course you're doing good <laughs> steven well it's i i think I'll try to answer it briefly. It's it's hard to consider. I think I'd be similar to James. Um, I, I remember finding myself at a time at the beginning of my career thinking how great it was going to be to be later on in my career, kind of fast forwarding through all this nitty gritty of figuring out who you are, what you want out of the program you're working with, what you want for, I should say, the program you're working with. Um, you know, I'd, I'd had some very busy years at Rogers and then last year I was just feeling. Yeah, we were both kind of at a, you know, head meet wall point a couple of times well, last year. Yeah, and, and our district was going through some, some interesting motions, if you will, <laughs> without going into too much, but, um, if I could go back and talk to myself, even at that point, I think I think a few things I would say, at least to maybe a year ago, Stephen, would be have patience and know that you will find inspiration. Um, and that also something Justin Wisness, our choral uh, colleague would always say is grow where you're planted. And, you know, the, the grass isn't always greener on the other side. And so, oh, thank you. Dawson just brought me fruit snacks. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Um, I, I think at times I thought that Open or closed. closed would be great, please. Yeah, the kids will connect you. Yeah, okay, we'll leave it open then. Thank you. <laughs> Anyway, for um, people who, who are unfamiliar with Stephen's offspring, he is decidedly adorable and, oh, and devilishly intelligent. Oh, yeah, he is very articulate. Very <laughs> articulate. Um, anyway, I, I, I'm realizing how, I think I always knew that this is, this is a collaborative field we are in and that we all feed off of each other, but more so than ever. I I feel so motivated and inspired by the people that I know and the people that I have yet to meet and uh, or people that I want to be better acquainted with. Um, I'm really excited to see both in how growing where you're planted turns out and just making everything as good as it can be because that's what our students deserve. Mm. Well, I think you've, you've hit on a, a great point there of, of how we can survive any circumstance is by relying on people we can trust and being available uh, for people who are looking for someone to trust. 
yeah. uh, you know, I'll, I think back to my time in Puyallup of when I was struggling and what helped me out was, you know, times with you after school in the office or, or our colleague Dan Davison. Uh, and my time here, you know, I'm not just going straight out my door into my car, but going through into the band room and talking to my colleague, Doug Gailey, uh, or, or giving James a call or um, every now and again, I'll, I'll get a, a nudge from uh, my distant colleague, Ron Jones, to check in with, you know, how did you handle the situation or uh, what would you do here? And uh, being willing to be vul vulnerable and reach out about uh, any given circumstance uh, with a colleague that you can trust and also being that colleague that someone else can trust is the way that, that we can survive just about any of our, our, our woes uh, in and outside of the realm of music. Well, I, I, think, I think we've said it all at, that, at this point. Uh, I've got just one more question off, off camera here, but thank you so much. Thank you, James. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, I really appreciate this conversation. I think um, as much for students as like fellow educators <laughs> uh, get something out of this one, it, it, at least if, if not enjoying Dawson's little chime, chime in here and there. Uh, so a, a, any final words, James? Um, no, other than that, you know, uh, I, I like what you said about, you know, all of us are out here doing the, the, the best we can do and, and recognize that your best is valid and, and, and just keep at it. And when you need a break, take a break, whatever it is, will be there tomorrow. And if it's not, okay, that's fine. Just, uh, we, we've got to take care of ourselves as, as well as our students. Steven, any final words? This is, is this going to your students, correct? Or is this yes. going to the ethos. Um, let music be your saving grace. Let it help you in moments of sadness and in moments of happiness. Yep. And uh, don't sweat the small stuff. <laughs> we, uh, we were at one of those moments this year where the kids were uh, maybe getting a little stale with the music. We'd maybe had it a little bit too long, getting trying to get on the other side of the concert. And uh, we had had some hard hardship in our community. And I reminded the kids that when we are playing music in class together for those, you know, five, six minutes that we are, you know, working on this song, nothing else has to matter. You don't have to worry about the test that's due in your English class. You don't have to think about what's going on at home. You don't have to worry about the friend that you have concerns for. For this, this, these five minutes that you're making music with your friends, that, that's all there has to be. This is the time we set aside to make music together and not worry about what else is going on. And often I find by not worrying about the problem and just making music, I often come up with solutions to a variety of problems just by getting into that, that flow state of letting, letting the music take over. Uh, so for everybody out there, I, I hope you're finding a way to make music and stay connected. Thank you, James. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, th this has been a great and very informative podcast.